The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. I'm your co-host, Holly Hurley, here as always with my co-host, Jill Henley. Hi, you, Jill. Hiya, Holly. How are you? Doing good. And I just wanted to remind everybody out there, um, if you haven't been on BaseNet's page in a while, go ahead and go over there. And I know some of you guys love to donate to us, and we love getting the funds from you. But this month, you can do something really special. Uh, BaseNet is donating 20% of our proceeds to the Jimmy Fund. And so all the money that you give to BaseNet, uh, or 20% of the money that you give to BaseNet, is going to go towards the Jimmy Fund and going to be given to them at the Scooper Bowl this year, which is super exciting. One of my favorite Boston events. I'm certain going to miss it this year and Jill's going to represent for me. I will be there. Yes, I will be there with my spoons. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also I guess while we're here let's give a shout out to our uh, creator of both our song, our theme song for Crashing Glass and actually our graphics, Marissa Levy. And if you're enjoying the music that you hear at the beginning and the end of our podcast, go to marissalevy.com and download her albums because they're absolutely amazing. Uh, my favorite song is uh, actually one she wrote uh, many years ago called Robert Downey Jr. Very timely with the Avengers movie coming out this uh, season. So please go and do that as well. And with no further ado, let's get into this week's topic. We're going to talk about some good food for every chick with, uh, with one of Jill's good friends, actually, Miss Tina Addison. Hi, Tina. Hello, Holly. Thank you so much for having me here. So, Tina, I mean, obviously, you know, this is something that's very close to my heart. How did you get inspired to start this initiative? Well, it actually started with a writing a cookbook. I had recently moved, this was about 10 years ago, and I moved to a different home. And when I did my unpacking, I could not find the recipes that from my mother and my grandmother that both were deceased. And I was heartbroken. Well, of course, I eventually found those recipes and immediately started putting them into the computer so this wouldn't happen again. As I began writing, I really enjoyed the idea of talking about the person that I received the recipe from. And from this, I decided to do other recipes from other friends and family. Now, I am a vegetarian, although I'm not plugging vegetarian, I'm just <laughs> plugging good food. And because I am all about good food. And as I was writing them, I decided that maybe I could do a little more with this. A wonderful person that I worked with, I'm actually a psychiatric nurse by trade. Uh, actually, I've met, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. And <laughs> I, I mentioned at work that I was having difficulty because I wanted to do something special about this cookbook and I wanted to illustrate it. And the next day, this psychiatrist, um, Vince DeSantis, that I worked with, came in with a wonderful magazine that most of you know, which is Cook's Magazine. And it's beautifully hand-illustrated magazine. Well, this inspired me to start taking drawing classes and then watercolors, which is now my favorite medium. So anyhow, I start writing, and over the years, I add more recipes and started putting it together as a book. But that wasn't enough for me. I decided... I really wanted to be able to get good food to food pantries. I recall many years, about five years ago, going to a food pantry and being sort of horrified looking at all the cans of vegetables and soups that were extremely high in sodium content. You know, we all know that diabetes and hypertension are on the rise. And these are two of the biggest springboards for all of our major health illnesses, especially heart disease, which is the number one killer of uh, women today. So I decided, you know, why am I bringing my garbage to these food pantries, the pickles I'm not eating, the chips my daughter never ate, and I wanted to get out of the house because I was afraid I would eat them. And I thought to myself, why am I bringing this to people who are in crisis economically and need good food. So then I decided that I would work with food pantries 
and that what I really wanted to do was bring good food to food pantry. So in an avenue to do that, last year in our town, we had a farm that was bought by our town. And it's Norfolk, Massachusetts. Yes, thank you, Jill. <laughs> and uh, it was called Gump's Farm. And uh, it's a beautiful area. And the town allowed me to use a 100 by 100 feet garden. And I was sponsored by the Grange Society. I am a Granger, and I belong to the Grange, which is a society of animal husbandry and farming. And our goal is uh, preservation of open spaces and education and uh, actually hearing disorders. So anyhow, I get a bunch of volunteers together, and we were able, I had 15 volunteers from the ages of five to 82. Oh, Those were my volunteer farmers. Sweet. Yes. And we were able to produce over 2,000 pounds of produce that went to our local food pantry. That's amazing. That's amazing numbers. Um, Holly, have you had any experience at all in your time with, um, you know, working with food pantries? I actually have only volunteered a few times, which I think gives you very limited experience. I think it's actually quite rare that people get the full hands-on experience. It's not for lack of need, I would say, but I'm actually, the ones that I have been to, one of the things that they told me is, you know, they always have a glut of things, especially where I grew up in East Texas. I remember the first food bank I went to, so they had a glut of things like white bread and peanut butter. Yeah. And that they really had a lack of things like fresh produce and that a lot of it was that, you know, they, they needed proper storage for those things. Those things had to come and go very quickly. And as you mentioned, Tina, there was really just a lack of people donating it. Right, right. You know, the one thing I do want to say, Holly and Jill, that there are two types of food pantries in this country. One, where you have to register and prove your economic need. These food pantries are actually federally funded, and they receive food from food banks. So if you think of it, the food bank is the storehouse, and then those food pantries become the grocery store for people in need. Then there is, and that's a very large amount of numbers of people who do go to those pantries. And then there are your local volunteer food pantries, and that's what the ones that I have been involved with in our area here. And these food pantries are often, um, I think, connected to some type of organization, be it a religious organization or local organizations. And these are the produce that people are donating from their own home. And these are the ones that I'm basically trying to target because the food banks are doing a great job in getting fresh, healthy produce to those food pantries. But our local ones, I think that we're limited. You know, nobody needs um, a lot of sugar and no one needs a lot of simple carbohydrates. And you mentioned uh, the white bread, Holly. And I'm gonna tell you, white pasta doesn't do much for you either. So what I've decided to do is during our growing season, when out here in Massachusetts, it's not very long. It's about four to five months but to at least be able to bring fresh produce to our food pantries. That's just such a fantastic, innovative thing because like Holly mentioned too, that you do hear that the canned goods, and often when, when, when communities are getting people to donate, they are donating things that are pre have preservatives and have canned goods, so there's an abundance, or, or not an abundance, but there's so much of that coming in, and so to add, to have this program of having fresh produce and fresh fruits and vegetables, I feel like this is something that would benefit every town and city in, in the U.S. It's almost like, you know, well, if you could just replicate it everywhere. Well, that's, that's why I'm talking to you today, <laughs> and I'm hoping people are listening. You know, in this country, we have, uh, according to the Department of Agriculture, we have 312 million people in this country. 50 million people are hungry. That translates into one out of six people in America are going hungry. If you think about your own neighborhood, I probably have 30 people in my neighborhood. That would mean every sixth person 
or every fifth person, excuse me, I have to do the math correctly, um, would be going hungry. And the faces of the hungry today are very different than when I grew up. You know, we they used to show children in Africa or Biafra um, and that those were the hungry. Well, let me tell you, turn around because the person next to you could be a hungry person. And if one little garden, there are over 3,000 towns and community, 30,000 towns and communities in United States. And if each one grew a 100 by 100 foot garden and produced 2,000 pounds of produce, it would make a huge dent in this epidemic that we call hunger. Wow. Um, just before we forget, I want to make sure we mention it now and then again later at the end of our podcast, that Tina has her own website where she has not just talks about her community garden here in Norfolk, Massachusetts, but also there are um, there's artwork for sale, lots of different projects, her cookbook that she's already mentioned, um, there's recipes, that vegetarian recipes. Yes, <laughs> for we get a recipe of the month. So you can subscribe to her website, and the website is Good Food the number four, for everyone.com. So it's good food and then the number four, everyone.com. So definitely check it out because there's so much different, so many things there, um, and she's doing such great work. So, um, I, Holly, I wanted to turn it over to see if you had any thoughts. Well, I actually, I'm really curious, uh, Tina, you're, you obviously have a passion for you know, you mentioned, and this is something that obviously Jill and I have had the great fortune to talk to a lot of people about, but a lot of women, or I mean, a lot of people out there in general don't really understand sort of the difference between food that provides nutrients and other kinds of foods and good food, bad food. You know, um, what what brought about this passion for vegetables and, and for sharing vegetables with people? You know, I mean, that's oh, a pretty specific goal. It is. It is, Holly. Well, I come by this very naturally. I am a farmer's daughter. I grew up on a dairy farm in Western Mass in a, call, in a town called North Brookfield. And ever since I can remember being able to walk, I can today vision being next to my mother in the garden. We had a huge garden area. And basically she would can most of our vegetables and uh, we'd have it all winter long. So we tried to be as self-sufficient as possible with our vegetables. So I just have this absolute love for food. And um, my husband has um, a couple of food allergies. So I try to be as careful about processed foods. So most of our food is not made from processed food. And that's, and that's a challenge sometimes to be able to cook without opening a can. Although some cans are just fine. Um, <laughs> But then my passion really turned into growing my own vegetables, my own gardening, which I loved. But it just didn't feel enough to me. And I wanted to spread it more. I have actually done many PowerPoint presentations on how to grow a volunteer community garden. Now, many towns have community gardens. that open land that the town leases to people individually to be able to grow their own produce either for their own consumption yeah. or to give it elsewhere. Yeah. But a volunteer community garden is designed specifically to bring the produce to food pantry. Now, I had a beautiful area last year. If you go to the website, you'll see a lot of pretty pictures and some of the people involved in it, a lot of the vegetables that we grew. But I have to tell you, I'm a little bit disappointed because they're going to be doing some construction in this land that we used last year. And because there will be, eventually there will be a community garden there, but we can't use it this year. So I had to go out and scout where I was going to garden. Now I have a 30 by 30 foot garden in my house. I actually don't even use my front lawn. It is now a garden. And you know, when you think of it, the number one crop that we have in, the, in America that uses the most water is lawn, grass. is grass. And if everybody, instead of growing grass, grew some kind of crop, wouldn't that be phenomenal? Think about how much we could help this problem with hunger. So yes, I am a little nuts and thinking that everybody should grow crops instead of grass. 
but um, it, it's a concept that I think is interesting. So anyhow, I cannot use that same land this year, and the volunteers are upset, but mm -hmm. I've been going to other organizations in town and asking people to grow an extra row, and so that we will continue to have this free farmer's market every Saturday at our local food pantry. But once again, that's not enough for me. So two years ago when I was at our local food pantry, I saw a huge whiskey barrel that was filled with cherry tomatoes. And I said to the woman in the pantry, gee, where are these from? And they said, oh, our local prison. They farm. And so a light went off in my head. And since I don't have the open field this year, I went over to speak to the superintendent of our local correctional institution. <laughs> there's a there's a correctional facility on, right at the edge of Norfolk, be <laughs> between yeah. Norfolk and Walpole. Right, right. <laughs> and um, the superintendent was more than glad to have me come in and work with some of the inmates to do gardening. And they, in fact, have a garden for the last four years. And I have to tell you, I went in and I saw it uh, the middle of March. And that prison is setting the bar for gardening in our town of Norfolk, Mass. <laughs> These guys are doing a phenomenal job, and it will be up and ready, and already started um, doing some of the colder crops. And these guys, there's a, it's a group of five to eight inmates, and they are more than willing to help and do a little bit more rototilling and add another garden. And that garden specifically will go not only to our food pantry, but we're going to have plenty extra to other local food pantries. That's just so wild. So I knew that Tina was getting involved with the with the prison and had gone. I didn't I didn't realize that it was. I thought it was maybe to start a community garden, a start a prison garden at the at the correctional facility. But they are going to actually do some extra and 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 donate that to the pantry. Well, you know, Jill, I thought going there. I was going to teach them a trick or two. And the fellow who actually has been running it for the last four years, one of the inmates, um, he also grew up on a farm. And he is so brilliant and he is so um, knowledgeable about organic gardening. And I, I'm going to have to learn a lot of tricks from him. <laughs> what he is going to learn from me is how to eat those vegetables correctly. Um, I like to be very creative with vegetables. A lot of the choices that I do um, with fresh vegetables, not even cooked, are things that people sometimes wouldn't even think twice about to use. You know, rather than those chips or those crackers, uh, you know, uh, zucchini kind of cut on the bias, mm -hmm. uh, cucumbers, sweet potatoes, they're mm -hmm. awesome raw. So those kind of things I'm going to be teaching the, the inmates and yes. and and there is there are many recipes on Tina's website so mm -hmm. that's definitely worth checking out and I just want to throw out there I, Holly and I have had a lot of interesting guests and we've only been doing this for since the beginning of 2012 and we've had a lot of guests in fact our most recent show was about a, a woman who involved the Peace Corps and very charitable and had kind of dedicated the last 10 years or more of her life to charity. Um, but to look to see what here what Tina's doing, is she's kind of the poster. She's the poster woman for social causes here <laughs> between <laughs> the prison as well as the community garden and donating to the food pantry. You you have a lot covered here. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, it's all about bringing fresh food and funds to food pantries. So I also teach watercolors in town here um, at the Sen Norfolk Senior Center in Norfolk, Massachusetts, and I have nine wonderful students and their price for painting is every week they have to bring a healthy food that I can donate to the food pantry. Okay. In fact, we're going to be having um, Norfolk Art in Spring and we're going to have an art show uh, that will be open to the town and the entrance fee, again, will be some type of food or article that can be brought to the food pantry. If we all just give a little, it ends up being an awful lot. Now, oh, go ahead, Holly. No, you go ahead, Joe. 
Oh no, I'm all set. I want to hear your your I want to hear your reactions and thoughts. <laughs> I just I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing that you've been able to do that. And I just I I wonder I, I mean, I hope it's really successful. I wonder how, I mean, obviously with the cookbook is your hope to incite this sort of action all over the country. Yeah. You know, do you, and, and how, let's say we have listeners right now who are just dying to be a part of this in their own community. How would you advise them to start? Okay. That, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of the volunteer community garden, is that what you're asking well, about? I think the volunteer community garden is a wonderful place to start, especially, you know, living in St. Louis now and coming from New York, it's a lot less popular in areas that have more flora than right. some of the bigger cities. And I think that's an interesting topic. But then after you talk about that, I'd also love to hear you talk about getting connected with your food banks and finding out what they need and, you know, things like that and how to really start being a force for helping to feed people as well. Yes, yes making a difference. Um, well, you know, if you want to do it, I really encourage cities and towns to do their own volunteer community garden. Trust me, it's not it's not brain surgery. Uh, the first thing is to define the scope of your project. Uh, I went to our local food pantry. I found out how many families are being serviced and um, the age groups. And that sort of dictated, it's like making a big dinner. It dictated what I was going to grow. I also went with vegetables and uh, that I was aware did very well in our own climate and soil. So if you don't know what's good in your area, you can always go to a local garden center and pick their brain. They're very knowledgeable people. They'll know what works best in your area. So the first thing is to figure out what you're going to grow and how much you, how much you're going to need. The next is to find volunteers. Uh, you have to really sort of scope out in your specific community how information is disseminated. Um, I live in a town that has several churches in the town. So I did go there. I spoke with them. We also have uh, a website called Norfolk Net. And a lot of people enjoy going on there and yakking during the day. And so I also advertise there. But I think the best advertisement I had was I, I made a, I had a sign made with a beautiful sign with uh, tomatoes and uh, greenery. And it had Northport Community Garden and my phone number on it. And please call. Well, that's what really was the best advertisement for us. You know, I'm... Um, just to ask a quick question here about choosing your garden. I know you're going yeah. through your steps, but what would be the, I know you need to find open land That's kind right. of before you even start getting the volunteers. And um, what would be the, the minimum amount of space that you would need to, to, ha to actually have enough, enough of a garden to make a difference? Oh, you don't need a lot of, a lot of space. You know, you can do vertical gardening where you can go up. Um, so the space is not necessarily the issue. The space, you know, when you're looking for space, it's like you're looking for a house. The first three most important things are location, location, location when you're looking for a house. In a garden, it's sun, sun, sun. So you want to try to find the sunniest place possible. For those parts of the country, here's a hint. If you have snowfall, the first area that starts to melt is going to be your sunniest part of your yard. And to have a really good, successful garden for most vegetables, it's going to be six to eight hours of daily sunshine. Um, a water source is an additional asset to have because, you know, Mother Nature is not always to be relied on for a little rain shower. And then once you do that, the next thing is Soil, soil, soil. Those are three of the most important things for your garden. And you have to correctly prepare the soil. Again, go to your local garden center, talk to them, and they'll tell you how to do it. After that, it's picking your vegetables, getting them in, and then the most tedious job, and the most important, I think, is weed control. What I like to do is I use newspapers. If you think about it, newspapers are biodegradable. And they are edible. 
because why would a newspaper make things that we touch with our hands and put in our mouth um, unsafe? So newspaper is very bio biodegradable and fine to use. So I put that down where all around my plants, and then on top of that, I add either heated hay so that the seeds in the hay are destroyed or salt marsh hay. We live by the ocean, so we are able to get a lot of the salt marsh hay. And that helps to keep the papers down and also provides the nutrients into the soil. Uh, the next thing to do is to figure out how you're going to get all these vegetables to the food pantry. And we would pick the vegetables, and I luckily have some extra refrigerators at my house. And so we would wash them and prepare them. And if you go on the net for every vegetable, like cucumbers, you got to put them in a plastic bag. Eggplant, do best outside of the refrigerator. So you're going to find out what, how to preserve your vegetables so they look great on market day. After that, it's just having the pleasure of going and being at the food pantry. We set up a big table. And um, people would come out of their cars and just pick whatever they wanted. But one of the things that I found that was most challenging were the frightened people of vegetables. So scary, <laughs> scary vegetables. <laughs> and they are intimidating. Oh, well, yeah. I would think that that end, that end result of going to the food pantry and having and offering out this produce mm -hmm. must be the most rewarding. Is it, that the most rewarding of it all? Jill, it was so heartwarming. That, that was a word I kept using was heartwarming. You know, when I went there, I met 30 families in the beginning. And at our food pantry, people just sort of pull up by their car and individually go into a small food pantry. And I would have to knock on the windows of the doors and ask people to come out and uh, come and select some vegetables. And they'd sort of, you know, who, you know, who are you, Tina? Um, who, who's this weird lady with all these vegetables? And by the end of the, you know, probably within two or three weeks, I would have people come early, get out of their cars, help me set up, and by the end of the summer, everybody would just get out and stand around and talk, mm -hmm. and I think that was one of the greatest things, that people would actually be doing networking, you know, and talk about, gee, I saw this in the paper, maybe that's something you're interested in for a job, or, you know, I need this, and I couldn't get it, and... It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, you know, I spoke at our local garden club. And I was at, it was at our beautiful library in Norfolk. And I did a, present, a PowerPoint presentation of the garden. And I have to tell you, all over 50% of the food pantry members came to that speech. And I was so touched. And... You know, it was nice. I met 30 new families in town that are neighbors of mine. And uh, it's very sad. You know, a lot of them are single parents with young kids. A lot of our elderly were participating in this. And uh, I just think that there's so much more that we all can do. I'm going to volunteer right now for myself and my two kids to be farmers this summer. Good. So, and we'll, so we'll be at the prison. <laughs> <laughs> which will be an experience, too. I just wanted to, as we sort of wrap up here, I wanted to say that, uh, and again, this is Tina's website has so much on it. It is so, uh, such a comprehensive website. I love it. But she does mention that on here, that the, the, agricultural, the U.S. Agricultural Department estimates that each individual eats uh, about just under four pounds of vegetables weekly. So I guess that's an average, right. um, hopefully. Um, I should, you know, hopefully I'm eating at least that much. But if you crunch those numbers with the garden that she started last summer, they were able to provide vegetables for 32 people every week. And that, so therefore the, har the garden's harvest exceeded the needs of the town's food pantry. So again, if we could take that, this fantastic innovative idea and spread it like wildfire, we would, and can you imagine how, like Tina's point here and sort of her one of her overall goals is to really make a dent into the hunger epidemic that we have. Not to be confused with the Hunger Games. <laughs> no, <you're not> <laughs> I just finished reading it. It was yeah. awesome. I'm starting yeah. the second book tonight. Uh, no. no, the so. Hunger Games is another. <laughs> <laughs>
That's uh, another, another topic altogether, if you will. Oh, another That's topic. Right. Another whole so, topic. Tina, so, I, yeah. Go ahead, oh. Holly. So, Tina, I'm really curious, um, what, what's your goal with the book? You know, the book is coming out soon. I'd love for you to kind of reference where people can pick it up when you're expecting it to be released one more time. And then basically tell us, you know, what, what, what would be success for you for this book? Well, yes. Thank you, Holly. Um, well, first of all, profits of the book go to food pantry. And what I would love to be able to do is to have towns and organizations invite me to speak to them. And when I do speak, I would like to have a book signing. Mm -hmm. And whatever books I sell for that town, those profits will go to your food pantry. The other thing I will also be doing. In each town. In okay. each town, yeah. correct. Uh, the other thing that I am planning to do is I will be also selling cards of a lot of my artwork. And those two, the profits from the cards, will also go to food pantry. So what I really, and I just finished, it's almost done, a video on how to combat hunger with good food for everyone. So that's going to be sort of my calling card, but I would love to be able to get the idea of volunteer farming across the United States. I hope it grows like weeds, <laughs> this idea. I, so do I. Yeah. Well, right. Tina, any advice for those of us with uh, black thumbs who just kill every um, touch? Yes, don't be afraid to try. You know, <sighs> I got to tell you, I, once again, it is not rocket science. I am a simple woman with a simple path. <laughs> and it is not that difficult to stick a seed in the ground and have a beautiful plant come up. That is great. Those are some words of wisdom right there. <laughs> because I don't have, I don't have the green thumb in my family either, but... There are, some of us do. So. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. No, not it, yet. it can be developed. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, I just wanted to say that, that this is such a, I, I find this to be such an, I, I don't know, just such an interesting, like, the passion, you know, to, to take, I, I, I think that some of what Holly and I like to get, to explore in this Crash and Glass podcast is the idea of all the different women out there and, and what their passions are and how they funnel that passion and that energy into doing good in the world. And I feel like we touch on this a little bit, you know, in a lot of our shows. And this is just sort of the, like this today's topic and talking to Tina really, I feel like it's, we haven't been able, we haven't had someone yet who is, who has such a really like a singular purpose that, you know, she's putting all so much effort into. So I really appreciate you being here. Well, you know, Joe, Having worked in psychiatry for almost 35 years, I have had the opportunity of, for people to share with me a lot of their sadness and difficulties through life. And, you know, tr crisis is something that we all can identify with and that we all go through in our own lives. So if I can help people in crisis of food, it's my joy. And I like to cook. <laughs> And you have a green thumb. Yes. It all comes together. And there's the artist side as well, yes. the creative side. Right? Okay. Well, I try to be creative. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I think we're going to move on. Holly, if you, do you have any other thoughts before we move towards Chick News? No, I think we're ready for some Chick News. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me, Holly and Jill. It's been a pleasure. Yes, it's been great. And we, we want you to stick around for a couple more minutes while we do our chick news because we, we like people, our guests, to weigh in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let Holly take that on. I just wanted to go back and mention, I know we talked about the Jimmy Fund and um, BaseNet donating some of the, um, you know, some of our uh, portion of the dollars that come in to the Jimmy Fund. And I just wanted to kind of circle back to that to say that the Jimmy Fund is kind of very near and dear to the hearts of us at BaseNet. It seems it's our main uh, charity that we like to donate to and, and work with as of, you know, up to now. And we do, we cover the Scooper Bowl each June, and then we covered the Jimmy Fund Walk um, in the Dana-Farber Walk for Cancer in September. So it's just a really great, um, you know, charity to also with a very near and dear to our hearts. So I just want to kind of point that out before we move on to the silly stuff. 
Thanks for doing that, Jill. So this, so this week, I guess it, there, there's a very, there's a nice balance. Uh, Hillary Clinton actually was in the news three times this week. Uh, first, I, I love this one. You talked about silly, and this is my favorite. Um, apparently, one of uh, one of the guys who uh, has a Tumblr account had started a site called Text from Hil Text from Hillary, and the you know, and the Tumblr features her in her sunglasses, you know, checking her phone on a military plane, you know, very like serious looking. And, uh, I like that she's wearing her sunglasses on the plane. <laughs> exactly, which I think is fantastic. But what I really love is that she actually texted. She actually texted to the website and sent them a text. So you know they do all these silly joke te joke texts from her, and no. she reached out to them and said, "Hey, I'd like to send you a real chat, a real text." Oh. So, so, so that's sort of the she sent the one that said, "Sup, Adam? Nice selfie." Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. So Adam is the guy, the, the creator of this. Cute. So that's great. So um, so she's so she's she is able to laugh at herself, which is a great quality in a yes. woman. Or anybody. Awesome. So, is, yeah, what else do you have for us? More Hillary news? Oh, yeah. Hillary news all the way around this week. Um, obviously, she spoke out at uh, North Korea. It, it, there's been some speculation that North Korea is trying to launch a rocket. Um, and they're saying, hey, it's just a satellite, but some of the intelligence from countries surrounding them say that that's not the case, that it's actually something much more dangerous. But what I absolutely love is, you know, Hillary can go from, you know, making these major negotiations abroad with hostile countries to, you know, texting someone on Tumblr while on a military plane. I just think that's amazing. And then, uh, and sort of the third part of this, I kind of call it the, the silly, the serious, and the speculative. Uh, oh, the speculative, right? right? <laughs> the three S's, yeah. silly, serious, and speculative. Uh, the third one was that uh, Hillary is actually, they're, you know, talking in the Christian Science Monitor about who might be picked to run after this next race, obviously 2016 being the one they're talking 2016. about. 2016, okay. And, uh, and Hillary being a real front runner for that. Now, she, of course, has said that she's not really interested, that she's thinking about retiring. Um, but I love that Bill came out in support of her and said, hey, if she decides to run, I'll support her. If she decides to, you know, run the foundation with me, I'll support her, whatever she wants to do. Yeah, you know, they have such a, uh, their marriage is fascinating Isn't to me. Yeah. Because I think we all wrote it off in 1996 or whatever year it was, the Monica Lewinsky year. <laughs> we all wrote it off and said, well... He's another, you know, sleaze bag and this and that. And how does she stand it? I remember being my feminist self saying, how does, why would she stay? And she's, you know, how does she wake up in the morning and look at herself and stay with him? But at the same time, I remember thinking, you know, she must have some thing in her head that she says, well, I am going to move forward as an individual uh, along with Bill, but, you know, I'm going to have, I have my own goals and I have my own things that are important to me. And obviously that's as, as a couple, as a married couple, they, they've gotten, you know, they, they've moved on or at least they've, you know, they have their own system that works, right? Who am I to, who are we to anyone else to judge <laughs> what goes on in their marriage? Um, and she has just flourished, um, you know, in her in her career, and I'm. It's very impressive to me and fascinating. And he has been very publicly supportive of everything that every move that she's made. Wouldn't you say, Holly? I would. Um, it, the scandal happened, as it turned out, I think in 1998. Okay. And the and of course she had started working uh, in 1995 there at the White House. And I think what's really interesting about uh, about the Clinton's relationship is, you know, a lot of people criticized Hillary and said, well, you're really just a first lady. You really just ride your husband's coattails and sort of nasty things like that, that people constantly say about very powerful women. And, you know, Bill said a lot of people marry, a lot of people marry people who are good for them politically or in their careers. I just happened to marry someone who was way smarter than me. You know, and he, he's always said that basically the real power of their relationship is that they are both very intelligent and both very driven and both very involved in what they want to do with their careers and that takes the front seat when it comes to their marriage and they 
have a very similar uh, relationship in that way, which I, I think is, is very fascinating. But I also think it's unfortunate for her. You know, she's in one of the most powerful positions of the world right now as the Secretary of State. And yet, you know, when you have a former president as a husband, and even if she does end up becoming the next president, people will always cite him first. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll still be Bill's, Bill Clinton's wife in, in some ways, right, yeah. I mean, to some people, and that could change, and I hope historically it does, but it is it is a, a fear of being in the situation they're in right now. I love that they have this great intelligent, this uh, a connection, intellectual connection. I think that that's probably one of the keys of having, keeping a, mar a marriage going for a long time. You know? you know, it's very interesting because when I think about what a marriage is, it's somewhat of a contract between two people. And contracts can be very different. There are hundred thousand different types of contracts as there are in marriages. And people have different reasons for being married. And you know, some things in your marriage go well and others don't. And I think that's for all of us. I personally have been married for 35 years and I've been very lucky uh, in who I found. And many of the times it is luck. But I have to tell you for the Clintons, when I think about being parents, they were awesome parents. Their daughter is a very special person. They kept her privacy. They kept her as a daughter, not as a figure out in the public. And I think that there were many things that came out positive from their relationship, and then there were some things that weren't positive. But you know what? That's life, um, and that's the way we all are. You know, we all make big mistakes in our lives. I've made many big mistakes. I'm sure I'll make more. But hopefully you make some good choices. And I think that they were able to do that. You know, as far as Hillary, if she becomes president someday, she will always be the wife of Bill. Of a philandering Bill, yes, probably. Of a philandering that, it, might Bill. Go, it might go down that way. Yeah, <laughs> it probably will. But you know what? That's something that we as women have been fighting for for a long time is to be put first rather than second sometimes. And, you know, when I was in college, I started college in 1970, and it was right in the middle of the women's movement. And, you know, it always bugged me that when at envelopes are addressed in the mail, it's Mr. and Mrs. And, and I don't know why. Name. I don't know why I have to be Mrs. Andrew Addison. My name is <laughs> Tina. It's not Andrew. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was just sort of the beginning of our wanting to be able to step up for ourselves. And I think Hillary's the kind of woman that's trying to do that. Yeah, and she she puts her she puts the money where her mouth is, you know, she's yeah. she's acting and not just not just saying it, which is a really she's a, she's a really uh, great role model, I think. And, and a brilliant woman. Well, and I definitely think I love I love what you said Tina and I'd like to highlight, you know, that I don't think that a woman should be defined by her marriage. I think we're way past that historically. And I think, and, and I love that she's done all these wonderful things. And, you know, we, we feel the need to talk about, I mean, obviously what Chelsea Clinton has done in her life is, has been amazing and what she had to overcome in the face of the public. But I think, I think it's important to, to, you know, say, hey, as a secretary of state, she's accomplished some things that no one's ever been able to do before. Right. And, and that I think is, is the coolest focus that we could take on her. And I just, I don't know. I just, I think when it comes to sort of, there's this, I was looking at the text from Hillary Tumblr that she actually commented on, and there's a, a shot of uh, the of Adrian Huffington and Hillary Clinton, and it says, who run the world, girls, you know, like the Beyonce song. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that's the appropriate tack to take, you know? I just, I think we're in that time, and I think we're ready to, I think, I think we've been stepping up. I think it's just a continuation of a theme, but I just love it. I love that line, who run the world, girls, you know? Yes. Or who runs the world, if you prefer, which I do on most occasions. Yeah. <laughs> so that they had that picture up recently. I didn't see it, but that sounds neat. Huffington yeah. Post. Um, well, I just, Tina's point was so... Um, such a strikes strikes with me because when I when I did my wedding invitations, you know, I did them 
I addressed them, meaning I didn't, you know, pay anyone to do calligraphy or anything. I, I got together with a girlfriend who had very neat writing, <laughs> very beautiful cursive, and she did them for me. And I, you know, we did them together over lunch. And I refused, even though the protocol for wedding invitations right. says, when, meaning I was mailing these out to family and friends, that you were supposed to write Mr. and Mrs. and then the name of the, the man's, the husband's first name and husband's last name. I refused, and so I broke protocol, and so I, because I'm like, I am not sending it that way, that's not me, so I broke the protocol of addressing the wedding invitations, and I wrote both person's name, the, the man's name, and then and the woman's name, so that that everyone was covered, it was, oh, my, it was my little, my little victory. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how, how, you know, you have so many giant victories in life, but sometimes those little ones are the ones that feel the best. That's right. <laughs> those are the ones we remember the most. That's true. Oh, well. Well, I hope you girls are doing good today out there in the world, and I hope you're thinking that you run the world. And please feel free to email us at crashingglass at uh, basenettv.com and let us know how you're running the world. And thanks for coming, Tina, and keep up the good work at goodfoodforeveryone.com. Thank you so much, Holly. It's a pleasure to be here. And that's it this week for the Crashing Glass Podcast. Okay, Holly, I will talk to you. I'll see you next week. Talk to you next week. that you please